This morning we come to uh, a new chapter in Titus, and uh, we'll be looking at the transformative gospel and the first of several groups, but the transformative gospel as it applies to older men. Now, I never cease to be amazed at how the sermon lineup of Scripture, when we are studying through methodically through the Bible, how very often just the right calendar events hit for us. And this morning is one of those events. And as we study this morning, you're going to go, oh, that's a pretty good lineup on Father's Day. And so uh, this morning as we come to God's Word, we'll notice that. The other thing I want you to notice on our sermon outline as you look at this is not just the title, The Transformative Gospel for Older Men. That, that'll make sense more in just a moment. But notice the Scripture box that is on the page. This is not just one or two or three verses that we often have. In fact, this is all of Titus chapter 2. So there's a reason that we have all of chapter Titus 2 that is here in two columns. And the picture is this. Like so much of the Bible, you simply cannot take one passage and really get the meaning of it without the context around it. Occasionally there are concepts and there's things there that are, that are in one passage of Scripture where you get pretty much the whole concept. But very often when we look at God's Word, we need to know what's before it and what's after it. What does it mean? I mean, how many times have we often heard people say, wait a minute, you said that I said such and such, but you're doing what? You're taking that do you know where I'm going? You see what I'm saying? You're taking that out of context. And we often see that in Christian history where different groups have taken things out of context. Or the church hasn't taken things in full context and gotten the full meaning and the full purpose of the whole thing. Well, this morning, this is one of those passages that is incredibly important that we keep it in proper context. And uh, we're going to see that over the next four weeks, how important all of chapter 2 is um, that we see the whole thing there. And part of the reason is it can turn into even more just legalistic, you're supposed to do this and you're not supposed to do that. You know, there's so many people um, that they just love the, you're supposed to do this, can I do this, can I not do that? I mean, we, we reduce our relationship with God down to... Um, prohibitions and commands, and that's it. Here we see God's much grander plan, and we have to do that all together. Now, for those of you who are new to us this morning, we're going to take about two minutes here and review just a little bit so you can know where we've been, and we'll have a little bit of fun with that even as we include the drawing from the back. But notice here, first of all, and on your outline, you can fill this in. Under the context and background, the first thing that we recognize is the Apostle Paul has left Titus on the island of what? Crete to straighten out messed up churches. So some churches were planted, but they were messed up. And we're going to look and remember, why are they messed up? Notice this. The, doctor, the churches had problematic leaders. It had problematic doctrines, and it had problematic, fill it in, behavior. And this is part of the, I've, I've left the one behavior open a little bit because this is a big issue on Titus chapter 2. So they had all three of these. All three of these are dealt with throughout the, uh, throughout the little letter to Titus, but they had problem leaders, problem doctrine, and problem behavior. They weren't acting like Christians. Look at the next part. In Titus 1, 5 through 9, Titus is told to appoint godly elders in the churches. So the whole letter starts out with him saying, you have to appoint qualified, godly elders in the churches. A church cannot exist without proper elders, ones who are honoring to God and who meet the qualifications of those who should lead God's people. Look at the next part. In Titus 1, 10 through 16, so in the following verses after that, Titus is told to get rid of ungodly, fake deceivers, ungodly, fake deceivers that, have, that they have for their leaders. So these churches are messed up because they've got worldly, carnal, very religious people leading them, but not in the gospel. So 
I mean, let me just tell you that that very often is a problem all the way through Christian history, 2,000 years worth of Christian history, to where we stand today in 2018, right here in America, right here in Hollywood. We, we, we need to recognize that this is a perennial problem in the life of the church, that ungodly people come in to seek to lead the church. We have to recognize that as a church family. We see, it, we see in those verses 10 through 16, fill these in, we saw their ungodly, you remember their ungodly character, their ungodly character. You see, they themselves were ungodly. They were rebellious, empty, selfish liars. The, the, in, in verse 10, they're called insubordinate. They're called empty talkers. Um, they're, they're people that just completely are misleading both in their character but also in their words. Look at the next part. We saw their ungodly motivation. And what was their ungodly motivation? It was greed and money. Has anything changed today? When you see ungodly leaders in the church, it is because they desire um, to have money and they desire to have fame and they desire to have many of these things. We talked about the $57 million Learjet that one pastor is right now trying to buy um, and unabashedly raising money for his $57 million Learjet. Um, so l- look at this. Their motivation is greed and money. Look at the next part. We saw their ungodly teaching. And the text from last Sunday is a very deep text. Um, Again, knowing the context of what he was saying makes it so important. The ultimate thing, the reason what they were teaching is so reprehensible, is so terrible, is that it's teaching works-based salvation. And works-based salvation says that what we do is more important than what Jesus did when he died on the cross for our sins. That is reprehensible. That is absolutely a damning belief that will send people, that will take people to hell. And so what we need to recognize is is that the whole message of the Bible is not that you can save yourselves. The whole message of the Bible is that God loves you so much that that he came to save his children from their sin. And so if you hear his voice calling you to have trust and faith in that belief today, don't turn that away. Maybe even today you would say, I feel like he's calling me to believe this and to identify this with this. I feel like he's calling me to identify with him, much like Sandra DeBone did today when she just said, I don't care what anyone thinks. I don't care what anyone says. I am with Christ, and Christ is with me. You see, a true Christian has that attitude. A true Christian says, Jesus died for me and rose again. I want to die to myself and all of my works, and I want to be raised to Christ in what he has done on the cross of Calvary that I, may, that I may walk in his power and his grace. This is the gospel. This is what we call people to here in the life of our church and what any church that teaches the Bible would call us to. So we, we look at this. The teaching is very important. Now, this is a good moment for you to flip over to your nice cartoon in the back. You say, our pastor likes cartoons. Listen, folks, I am so simple-minded. You've got to make it basic for me to get it. And I know that some of you feel the same way. In fact, the higher your IQ is, the more you may like stuff like this, and maybe as well, I don't know. So, but notice this with me, Um, and, and first of all, just look at the screen at first. All of this comes from a group called The Bible Project. I would encourage you to become familiar with them online. They have wonderful free online services and online sources for you. One of those is drawings of every book of the Bible. So look at the screen. The big picture here is right here, and you look at that, and you go, wow, that's just so much. What does all that mean? Well, they made videos to explain it, and as you look at that, and you can go to any, any book of the Bible, and in fact, many of the key doctrines of the Bible, and they have animated it in such a way that anyone and everyone, from the intelligentsia down to a child, can understand the basic messages of the Bible in a very, very beautiful artistic way. So what I have done this morning is simply taken a portion of the larger story of the book of Acts, you see the blue box on the screen, and I've reduced it down to where we can see just that, or I've actually um, expanded it so that we can see that. So now look at your outline or at the screen above. 
And notice that first segment in there. In Titus 1, 5 through 16, we see Titus is told by Paul, appoint elders. And these are to be, you see where the dolphins are over there, which is a sign of nobility in the ancient world, mature husbands and fathers known for integrity, self-control, and generosity, able to teach what? The good news. Good, you're following. So he's saying there's Titus there with the sun hat on because he's a missionary, he's traveling around. Titus is told, appoint godly elders that meet the qualifications for the churches. Number two, look at in the black box, or the black circle there, the next section, it says in verses 10 through 16, you are to confront what? Good. You're to corrupt, confront the corrupt leaders. And notice who these guys are. You see one down there in his religious guard as a Pharisee, and another one just as a powerful individual. They're saying, no pork. They have a knife. Come here. It's time to be circum circumcised. And one guy standing there is going, who? Huh? And the gal is going, what? And so, you know, you see. And what's all around the base of their little, the, their little pulpit? Money. So you see this picture. So um, you see the monkeys over there to the side, and actually in the Mediterranean world, the monkeys are a sign of liars and thieves. Um, there was two people that were thieving crooks. They got turned into monkeys in Greek mythology, and then Zeus um, actually turned them into stone. But when you see monkeys around, and really banditry monkeys, um, and these exist even today on Gibraltar, it's very, very interesting. The Mediterranean world, this is a sign of corrupt, lying thieves. And so notice this. They're demanding circumcision and Torah observance motivated by money. Now, at the bottom of that, Epimenides said, Cretans are always liars, vicious beasts, and lazy guttons, gluttons. Now, look at this at the bottom. They claim to know God, but they deny him, but their actions deny him. Circle the word actions there. You see, our actions matter. Our actions matter a lot. And that, in fact, leads us to chapter 2. And so, aren't you excited? We get to change chapters now after 18 messages. So now we come to chapter 2. And as we come to chapter 2, here's what we want to recognize and what we want to see. Fill this in. This is back on your front sheet. In verses 11 through 14, in verses 11 through 14, the gospel of God's grace through Jesus, excuse me, the, the focus shifts, yeah, let's do that first. The focus shifts from the leaders to the congregation. So the leaders have been dealt with in chapter one, get good leaders, get rid of the bad leaders, and now the spotlight turns to the congregation. And as we look at the congregation, the 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 congregation is, is brought out in what they are to do and what they are not to do, how, are they, how they are to live and how they are not to live. And so we, we want to recognize this beautiful picture of that. Now, now the, the other thing I want you to notice at the bottom of the page is this. In verses 11 through 14, the gospel of God's grace through Jesus gives the reason and the power to live a certain way. He gives the reason and the power to live a certain way. Now, what is it that he has given the reason and the power? Go back up a little bit, and I want us to actually go back to our diagram. Let's go back. Well, let, let, let's just, let me read it first, and then we'll go back to the diagram in just a minute. Look at the chapter in the box on the page, verse 1. Here we're going to see that the, that the focus is shifting from the leaders to the congregation. Look at verse 1. But as for you, teach what accords with what? Sound doctrine. So now he's going to describe what goes with sound doctrine. Right above the word accords, goes with. So he's not saying teach sound doctrine at this point. He's already said that. So he's told him, be careful to only teach sound doctrine. Anyone who's not teaching sound doctrine, what is he supposed to do with them? Two things. You remember what it said in, verse, in chapter 1? Come on, y'all. If somebody's not teaching sound doctrine, what is Titus supposed to do with them? I heard somebody say it. Number one, silence them. You must stop them from doing that. Number two, rebuke them rebuke them and show them the error of their ways. So 
that he's already told them teach sound doctrine, get rid of those who don't teach sound doctrine. Now he's talking about what goes with sound doctrine. You can know all the right things but not do it. In fact, there's many, uh, Jesus said, who know the right things to do and they don't do it. James said, it is sin for you to know the right thing and, and don't do it. And so here comes what accords with sound doctrine, what goes with it. And he, here we see in verse 2, he says, older men, circle older men, older men are to be sober-minded, dignified, self-controlled, sound in faith, in love, and in steadfastness. Number three, verse three, circle older women likewise are to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers or slaves to much wine. They are to teach what is good and to train the, circle it, younger women, train the younger women to love their husbands and children. Verse 5, to be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind in submission to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be reviled. Just simply underline that the word of God may not be reviled. So here we're starting to see one of the reasons to live in a different way, right? One of the reasons to live in a godly way. So that when others from the outside are looking at your life, that the word of God may not be reviled, so that other people do not look at the message of Christ and say, yeah, right. Because they see ungodliness in us. So that the word of God may not be reviled. Look at verse 6. Likewise, urge the younger men. What do I want you to do? Circle it. Likewise, let the, urge the younger men to be self-controlled. Now, that is a mouthful right there. Let the younger men be self-controlled. We're going to hear a whole sermon on that. Look at verse 7. Show yourself in all respects to be a model of good works, and in your teaching show integrity and dignity and sound speech that cannot be condemned. There it is again. That cannot, be, underline that, that cannot be condemned. Because you see, people want to take our words, they want to take our message, and they want to condemn it because of what they see in us. So now we're starting to see the importance of why what we do in the way we live is so important to our witness and to God's glory. So look at this in verse 8. And sound speech cannot be condemned so that an opponent may be put to shame, having nothing evil to say about us. There it is again. keeps coming up. Now look at verse 9. Circle the word slaves. Slaves are to be submissive to their own masters in everything. They are to be well-pleasing, not argumentative, not pilfering, but showing all good faith so that in everything they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior. That is a beautiful statement that in a few weeks we're going to see why slaves were called to do this and how God, what God means in this calling to slaves. So what have you circled so far? Let's read it out loud. What have you circled so far in verse 2? Older men. Verse 3, older women. Verse, what, what was next? 4, yes, thank you. What's next? Young women. And then young men. You see that. And then we see, verse 9, slaves. So these are key groups in, this, in the whole motion and in the churches that are there. Now look at verse 11. For, now I've bolded it and, and underlined it, you circle it. Th th this means something. The word for is very important. It's giving all these commands, and here's the reason why those commands are there. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright and godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ. Verse 14, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for him a people for his own possession who are zealous for what? Good works. You see, good works aren't a bad thing. 
You just can't depend upon the good works to save you. Verses 11 through 14 show us it's all about the work of Christ on the cross that saves us. That's the good news. But if we've been saved, we are called to live it. And if you're not living it, if you're not living it out, then it would indicate that you're not saved. Now look at verse 15. He says the very strong words in verse 15. Let's read out, out loud verse 15. Declare these things, exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no one disregard you. Uh, that was very weak, but we won't do it again. Um, <laughs> look what it says. Be, declare these things, exhort and rebuke. And don't rebuke a little bit, but with all authority. That's amazing. These are sharp words. Let no one disregard you. you know, some people, they hear the rebuke and they go, yeah, well, whatever, that guy. And then they just keep doing what they're doing. And he's saying, no, in the life of the church, you can't do that. If they, if, if they are not teaching the truth and if they are not living the truth, then the apostle Paul is telling Titus, Titus, you don't let them disregard you. That th These are not options. You see, this is the authoritative, beautiful word of God that calls us, and the, the stakes are high. The stakes are high for our own souls, and the stakes are high for the souls of those who are watching us. It's the stakes of eternity. And so he's saying this is, a, this is an important matter. This is not a joke. Um, so just kind of notice this and look with me on your outline. I want you to notice this. Notice the inseparable link, and I want you to get this. It's so obvious in this, especially in verse 1. But notice the inseparable link between believing right and what? Living right. You see, if you believe right, you're called to live right. And we can see in many passages of Scripture, if you believe right, you're going to live right. I mean, that's, that's what the true obedient Christian life is all about. Uh, Jesus said, if you love me, then keep my commandments. If you love me, do what I say. Jesus also said this, you don't do what I say, so you don't love me. I mean, he makes that judgment. He says, it's obvious that you don't love me because you don't do what I tell you to do. And so here there's this great, when, when you're talking about the creator of the universe, words go with actions, and actions go with words. Um, look at the first verse there. It says it right there. But as for you, where do we get that from? But as for you, teach what accords with sound doctrine. So there's something that goes with sound doctrine, with truth, and it's a lifestyle. Look at verses 2 through 6. And we've kind of noticed this a little bit, but the instruction is to all adults in the church by age and by gender. So he separates it out because now he's going to hone in on a few differences that we deal with. And as he does that, notice the order, and I've made a box here and it's there, but notice the screen so you see it in this way. First he deals with older men. And then what comes next? You're memorizing it as we do it. Older women. And then what comes next? Younger men? No. What comes next is younger women. And then it's sandwiched back to younger men. And then as he, as he deals with that, we, we begin to see that he's kind of coming around the circle here uh, in the process of all adults, male and female. And then, because their society was so segmented by slavery, there were upwards of 20 million slaves. It's 20 million slaves in the Roman society at that time. I want you to see this. He then goes to the issue of Titus himself and then slaves. And so we'll look at both of those. Now, I do think there's room there for you to notice out to the side of um, verse 7 through 8, there's instructions to Titus. Now, we've already said that chapter 2 is about the congregation, right? And as I was praying and thinking about this message and thinking about you and saying, Lord, I don't want to miss anything you want me to say, show me what this, what this may be, the Lord brought this to mind. So I think he wants us to recognize this. Leaders in the church are part of the congregation. It's important for us to recognize that the pastors are not separate from the congregation. Um, those who teach are not separate from the congregation. The, the deacons and the, other, the two offices of the church, elders and deacons, deacons are not separate from the congregation. 
It's not like they're different bodies. No, listen, Titus is, is right here in the midst of all the instructions of how the people are supposed to live and sandwiched in between older men and older women and younger women and young men and slaves is Titus. And so right in the middle of it all, and so, I mean, that could be pastors, um, other leaders that are here in the life of the church. Make sure that your life and make sure that your words do not give the people that are on the outside looking in reason to not believe the gospel. And that is so, so important. You see, pastors are just as submitted to the congregation, should be just as submitted to the body of the church as any other member in the church. I should be as accountable, Pastor Lucas, Pastor Ben, Tommy, anybody else that becomes um, elders in the life of the church, whether they're staff elders or whether they're lay elders, they're, they're businessmen or women, or, or businessmen in the life of the church, um, that is the picture, this is the picture, that we are under the authority of the congregation of the church. Now, notice the next part here, verses 9 through 10. Slaves. And so, we're going to look at, wow, slavery in the church. How did that work? What did that look like? We get a little hint from that in the Gospel Project um, diagram again, and I want you to see this. Go over to the Gospel Project diagram, and I want you to look at this. This is so helpful to me. Um, the top, the top of it shows the present reality. The churches are out of control. There's a big mess. They don't really understand the gospel. The way that they live in the church isn't very different from the way that people live outside the church. And notice this, you know, the guy has the big picture there. He's kind of one of the older men, and yet he's like, woohoo, yeah, Jesus, you know, I mean, and he's, he's got a young gal hanging on his on his, underneath his arm, and then you've got the woman that is standing there, and she's got a drink in her hand, and she's kind of got bubbles popping around her, I mean, she's kind of drunk, and then you see the, the young girl, she knows she's pretty, whatever, she knows she's young, she knows whatever, and so she's whatever, and then what do you see, the young guy over there, he's like, uh, you know, he's just looking at the young girl, I mean, this is the whole picture, and then you see slaves off over here, the slaves over here washing the feet, and is he happy about all of this? No, he's angry at the master. I mean, so this is not at all a pretty picture for the gospel. And then the people on the far right side, you know, they're saying, Christians, what a joke. You know, who is this? So look at this. God's word is, this is the outline that are on the, the cartoon there. God's word is discredited. People make evil accusation. The Christian message just simply isn't compelling. But the Christian household, the, excuse me, the Cretan household, Jesus style, is very different from that. And that's the next one down. Now we begin, and you can see it on the screen as well. We've put the, the, the positions there a little bit. The fathers are respectable. The, the older men are respectable. The older women are also respectable. And they're spending time appropriately with the younger women, bringing them along. And the young men, the young men are to be productive, and the young men are to be self-controlled and doing what they're supposed to do. And what's interesting about this picture, it also shows the slave, perhaps next to the little girl with the dolphin, the slave, the picture of the slave is that he's not just at the feet of the master, but in the church, as a Christian, he has value, equal value before the body of Christ. And this is a, a beautiful picture of the transforming gospel of Christ. Now, we're going to talk about how does Paul encourage them to interact and what does call, Paul call them to do and not do um, so as to further the gospel the best. But here's the picture. Look at this. The gospel must prove itself in the public square. Christianity is compelling when it looks culturally similar but is based on different value system and devoted to a different God, not the gods of the age or the gods of self. And then we come down here to the beautiful picture of, of verses 11 through 15, where all of this comes from Christ. Look at the top picture, the worldliness, the present reality. Look at the middle picture. This is what God is calling us to in these com commands. And then where does that come from? It comes from God's generous grace. We have to recognize that. Now, the reason I want you to see this so vividly is this. When 
when people preach on commands about what Christians are supposed to do and not do, what they're supposed to be and what they're not supposed to be, the motivation for it can often become legalism instead of grace. The very opposite for it, it can, we so quickly can slide into a mode of, well, you're not doing what you're supposed to do. You're, 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 you're failing to meet with the church, you're, you're not coming to church, or you're not giving, or you're not doing this, or you're going to things that you shouldn't go to, or you're wearing something you shouldn't wear, or you're, you know, we immediately go to all the behavioral things, and, it, and if we're not really, really careful, it becomes all about the fact that you're not adding up. And we need to be very, very careful to see that godliness is not a code that we're trying to add up by. Godliness is, a listen to this, it's an outflow of what we've become as children of God. And children of God still have to be called to that. They still have to be called to the standard. They still have to, listen, they still have to be taught what is right and what is wrong, what is appropriate and what is inappropriate. Listen to this, what is godly and what is not godly. We still have to learn the system of what God says is good and holy and just and right and pure, and that which is unpure, that which is sinful, that which is fleshly, that which is, listen, going to pass away. And so it's not that these instructions are not important for us to see. They're very important for us to see. But we must understand the motivation. So all the way through these messages on Titus chapter 2, we want to remember and listen, keep in mind the last part of the chapter, verses 11 through 14, that we see right here. And I, I, I just want you to see that this is the reason and the power that we live like this. You may be already filled that in. This is the reason for the gospel, and this is where the power comes. You see, a lot of people, they say, well, I just can't be a Christian because I can't stop drinking like that, or I can't stop looking at gals, or I can't stop lying, or I can't stop cheating, or I can't stop, you name it, whatever it is. I just, I don't have any part in that because I, I tried and when God was handing out holiness, I didn't get any, and yada, 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 and that's kind of their mindset. But see, that's like trying to, trying to live the Christian life um, without actually becoming a Christian. And there's many who, who get caught in that. And I want to say to you, if somehow you've come into this place today, and you, you, you would say, well, maybe I've been doing that. Maybe this whole thing has seemed so far off and so impossible and implausible to me. Maybe it's because you've never been converted to Jesus. You see, Jesus comes to forgive us of our sins and to give us really a reason to live. And how about this? A beautiful reason to die so that we can be with him forever. And so this is the big picture that God shows us the reason and the power to live like this. And he shows it through his grace in Christ Jesus. And this shows God to the world. This is how the world sees God the best. Um, it's not through your super ability to preach the gospel. It's not through your ability to argue, knock down every argument and everything else. The, the best witness to the world is a church that loves God and loves each other. That is the best witness to the world. That is what causes people to go, who are you people? What did this? That's one reason it's so beautiful for this room to be truly a multi-ethnic room. That's just a, a quick way that people come in, glance around the room, and go, oh, this isn't a white church. This isn't a black church. This is a Latino church. This is, and of course, we're being taken over by Russians and Brazilians and everything else. So I know <laughs> Latinos are Brazilians. But, um, but I mean, this is, this is a Christian church. And so when the world starts to see that, and they start to see, no, we really love each other. We don't, we don't just cluster with our own. We really do love each other, and we enjoy each other. We have meals together. We take care of each other's kids. We, we pray for one another. We help one another. When, when the world starts to see that, they start to go, what? What is this? Many of you have said that shows up in the hospital rooms. You're wondering why you got sick or why your child is sick, and it, it's gotten you frightened and you're very upset about that, and then you look around and you see 
church members that are there and your family who doesn't know the Lord sees that and they go, wow, that's amazing. Okay, many of you have looked at the clock and you say, we're in trouble. No, we're not. We're going to go really fast. Shake your pen. Warm up your pen. Are you ready? Flip the page. I want you to see this. The first one has to do with men. Very appropriate here on Father's Day. Look at verse 2, or chapter 1 and verse 2. But as for you, teach what accords with sound doctrine. Verse 2, older men are to be sober-minded, dignified, self-controlled, sound in faith, in love, and in steadfastness. We've already said that accords means goes with. So this is life with truth. And here it is. Who qualifies as an older man? Older men, the Greek word that is there, presbyte, is used several times in the New Testament by Paul to refer to himself. So we know that he was middle-aged and then getting older as the years went on. And it is used by Luke to describe Zacharias, the father of John the Baptist. Now this was an old man. When he was told by an angel that he would have a baby, he said, but I'm an old man. And my wife is what? Advanced in years. So here's an older couple. So this word being used to describe Zacharias, it's true that that's an older man. But the picture here is, is really, and I believe the ESV is properly translated, older men. It's not old men, older men. So you've got a spectrum of, for the men, they're either older or they're younger. And so wherever that is in your culture, wherever that is in your society, wherever that starts to go, the difference between older and men, this is talking about just the older guys. I don't know whether it's half or the older, you know, whatever that would be numbers-wise or proportion-wise, but it's just in your culture as, as we see this here, that the people that are the established men, these are the ones that wouldn't be considered younger men, so they, they side with the older men. So that, that's who we're talking about here. And we can say that it's, it's not a new guy getting his life started out. This is a guy that's, that's gotten going. Number one, he is to be sober-minded. And this very quickly, this, and this comes from the verse right up there in the top, he is to be sober-minded. This means someone who has a reputation for not being impaired or by overindulgence in anything, whether it be alcohol or anything else. It is a phrase that comes from the idea of inebriation or the, the effects of alcohol, though that is not what it's restricted to. It can come, maybe it's through money, or maybe it's through fame, or maybe it's through some super ability that he has that he remains not drunken with his fame, not drunken with his wealth, not drunken with his education and his intellect, not drunken with anything. He is a sober-minded man. He, he comes to life with a sober intent. Notice this here with me. This is their discipline of life becomes a clarity of mind. So he's disciplined not to indulge in these things, not to think highly of these things, and this brings him a clarity of mind. All older men should be mature in this way. Look at the next part. He is dignified, and this carries the word with it that he's honorable and respectable that when people look at him, they think of dignity. They don't look at him and think of frivolity or immaturity or that which is not valuable. Look at this. This person does not stoop down to trade insults or to find humor in the crude joke. This person generally, excuse me, genuinely reasons and holds in high value the worth of others and that which is good. So a dignified man has a position that he doesn't look at the easy small stuff and engage in the easy small stuff. He has a maturity about him that sees the value of others and sees the value of that which is right and good, including the value of discipline. Number three, this is the self-controlled, and this is a very important word, um, a word that our culture doesn't know a lot about. But this carries the idea of soundness. This is where it comes from. It has to do with a good, a good foundation, a solid foundation that isn't crumbling and giving away. It, it's, it's positioned 
and it has, it has a stamina that is there, or that which is a, ba- a basis and a foundation. So the, let's look at this, fill it in. So the inside value controls the outside behavior. That's, that is someone who is self-controlled. He has a foundation of knowing what is right, and so that controls his behavior. Regardless of the circumstances, regard, you know, maybe he's real tired, but he's self-controlled over his fatigue, and he knows he's got to get up and go to work. He's self-controlled in that way. He doesn't just say, nope, not going to do it. He gets up and he goes to work. Or he's self-controlled. He knows that this traffic accident has caused a horrible disagreement, and there's concern and everything else, and this other person is acting like a real punk, and I, he doesn't go down to that level. Instead, he just simply says, you know what? Um, I am going to be self-controlled in this. And I'm not going to go down to another level that's here. Um, there's many, many different ways it would play out, not just in anger situations, but notice this with me. Fill these in. This is not a man with an anger control problem. We are called as Christian men to not have, he, we're not called to be like an infant, a baby. What does a baby do? You take something away and he, wah! I mean, you just, I love to watch it every now and then in the nursery. It's actually rather humorous. I don't, I don't, go, that's one of the reason they don't let me in there. But I mean, I, I just look at it and I go, oh my gosh, look at that. You know, I mean, you, you look at them, there's no self control. I mean, they're upset and, wah! It all comes out. And I mean, that's why we have to have bouncers in the nursery to keep them from fighting one another and everything else, you know, I mean, they can, they, if they haven't learned yet, they can go over and, <laughs> I mean, you know, they're thinking to kill. And so you, the you, self-control, that, you have to learn self-control. Uh, a mature Christian man should have self-control. Look at the next one here. This is not a man with a me too problem. Some of you are going, what in the world is a me too problem? Well, just go click on CNN, Fox News, and you'll know about what me too in the current culture is. This is a man who doesn't sexually objectify women. Um, This is a man who doesn't attack women. This is a man who sees women for what they are, creatures made by God that deserve respect and dignity and honor, and doesn't just sit there and look at them and think, wow, you're here for my enjoyment. You see, that that is the epitome of ungodly behavior. And whether it be toward his wife or whether it be toward somebody he doesn't know. Um, The picture is the godly Christian that we're all called to be if we are older men is not having a Me Too problem, not having a sexual problem that that is simply objectifying women. Look at the next part. This is not a man who has uncontrolled desires or impulses. He has desires and he has impulses but what's the key? They're under control. And that is the picture, um, that they are under control. That doesn't mean a little bit's okay, guys. That, that it means that we are truly bringing every thought captive unto the life of Christ, unto the submission and obedience to Christ. So this is the picture that is here. Look at number four, and we're all about to finish. He is also sound in faith, in love, and in steadfastness. Faith, love, and steadfastness. These three words that are here and we see them. He's sound in faith. This means what? That they know that God can be trusted. These Christian men, mature older men, know that God can be trusted. They are to know that God's word is true. They are to know that his word is authoritative and it's true. They are to know that God's plan will prevail. We need to have good theology, good understanding, good, and his years of walking with God should be that God is true, his word is true, and his plan will prevail. We can trust him. Not only that, but he is to be sound in love. They are to come to God, excuse me, they have come to love God above all things. They've come to love God above all things. They've come to love others more than self. This is a nice uh, comparison that is here as a progression here. God, love God, love others more than self. They have come to understand that love is not earned. 
It's not? No, it's not. Love is not earned. Love is freely given. This is the picture of God. And it's this, this needs to play out in parenting. This needs to play out in marriage. This needs to play out in every aspect. As we have been freely loved, that we are called to love others, not based upon their performance, but based upon God's value of them. Look at the next part here. They have come to love the right things. They've come to love the right things. Um, 1 John chapter 2, verse 15 through 17 um, the, the only verse I'll read on that, look at the screen above you. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. That goes on to talk about loving the wrong things, but the love of the Father is not in him. He has come to love the right things. And then finally, sound in steadfastness. This guy is steadfast. The kind of Christian that's a mature Christian that should be every older man in the life of the church, he should be steadfast. This is what that means. They hold fast when others let go. They're holding the line. They're holding fast when others are letting go. They endure hardship with faithfulness. Even though it gets hard, even though it's difficult, difficult they're still faithful to God and faithful to others. They accept disappointment and continue. They accept disappointment and continue. How about this? They continue despite tiredness, weakness, being misunderstood, and how about the last one, which may be the most difficult, and being unappreciated. They continue despite those things. This is the picture of of God's love toward us. God's love hangs on even when, when things are very difficult, even, even when he's there in the Garden of Gethsemane and he says, if there's any way, let this cup pass from me. And the beautiful picture of him saying, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And he goes to the cross for our salvation. So, in this all, we see the older men in the body of Christ are to be a model of what it means to faithfully walk in God's grace with God's people in a fallen world. This is the picture, that we are to be a model of what it means to walk faithfully by God's grace and with His people. Now, in the... The fuel for all of this is the cross of Christ, and I hope and pray that that's what we recognize and that's what we embrace in every way.